That's right. And thanks a lot. And also thanks to the organizers for uh, asking me and providing the opportunity to uh, speak here. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to report. I think this is also important to say, especially in a course like this where we talk about drugs and, and all kinds of things. It's important to, to, to be open about conflicts of interest. Um, um, I'm talking about obesity prevention, environmental determinants. The schedule says that it's focused especially on built environments, so I will do that. But I will also touch upon other types of environment. Uh, because our health is a function, a function of where we live. This is a quote from an editorial in the Lancet uh, from a couple of months ago. And uh, that indicates also that, these, that it is uh, more and more popular and also accepted in the broader scientific uh, field of research that, that the environmental influence is really there and also important. Uh, just a couple of days ago, also in the JAMA, a paper came out about environmental uh, influences of physical activity. It was about walkability. <clears throat> I'm from the Netherlands. This is how we celebrate our birthdays. It's a picture from Marius van Dokkum. And you see clearly the environment is really obesogenic, as we call them. Obesogenic environments. Indoor, in-house, obesogenic environments. We also call them upstream determinants. Uh, um, opposite to what you say, the downstream determinants, what happened here in the, in the gut and the connection with the brain. And um, uh, so upstream, that is also a term. Um, there's, a, there's a small story that illustrates this term. It's from three doctors. They're sitting next to a stream having a picnic. Uh, it's a rapid stream and uh, they enjoy the view only to hear that there's screaming coming from the, from the stream. There's a kid. Kid fell in the, screen, in the stream and he's driving off to the waterfall and soon will die there. So they, they don't hesitate and jump in to the river. They save the kid. But there's another kid in the river. And they put all their efforts together in, to save that kid and another and another. So there's humongous amounts of, or loads of kids <laughs> in the river. And they, they, they are able, with a lot, a lot of work, they are able to save many of them, almost all of them. And they got creative. One of the doctors, they um, has a couple of branches so he can make some kind of boat and save two at the same time. The other one has a rope. So whenever a kid is out of his reach, he can throw the rope. And the third doctor is getting out of the water and walks away. So these two doctors, they, they look at him and they say, hey, come back here into the saving these kids. We are... We need to save them. And then this third doctor says, no, I'm going to walk upstream and look who or what is throwing these kids into the water. So that's upstream. Um, <coughs> well, you have obesity and maybe further down the line, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. They are determined by unhealthy lifestyle behaviors. Um, uh, lack of exercise, le lack of physical activity. Uh, sedentary behavior, which is uh, different than a lack of exercise, and dietary behavior. And these are in turn influenced by our environments. Um, so this is the um, maybe a bit complex slide. Uh, it, it will only be simpler from here. I will walk you through it. So here you have uh, physiology, obesity, type 2 diabetes and behaviors, and here you have the upstream the environments, right? So here you have the behavioral patterns, and the physiology, the energy imbalance, and here you have the, the way you can intervene. So on the physiology and type 2 diabetes side of things, you have the drugs and surgery. Uh, here you have the health promotion programs, the social marketing, etc., trying to influence behavioral patterns. And further, further upstream, you have the systemic drivers and environmental drivers that can be influenced by policy interventions, such as uh, tax on sugar-sweetened beverage. Um, in, in the Netherlands, we have a law stating that if there is a, a road where, you, where you're able to drive faster than 50 k's an hour, then they are, the government is obliged to 
have a cycling lane next to it that is really separated from the road because of safety, maybe. Um, so that's policy. If you look at pol population effects, um, Pedro already touched upon it. Uh, the Rose, Jeffrey Rose, with small uh, differences in po population, have a huge effect on, on the whole, but very little, maybe the individuals. But the population effect of these systemic policy interventions is bigger. Also, the political difficulty, because you, it takes a while before it translates into behavior and physiology. And then your term as a politician is already gone. Evidence base, hugely skewed toward the right. So we know with RCTs and um, with placebos we can provide and we can follow people up. Evidence is here. So if you would look for evidence-based interventions and you can only choose from evidence-based interventions, you will end up somewhere here. Polit public and media political, political discourse also usually skewed towards the right. Also political mandate, I touched upon it. It's ba uh, based on uh, Swinburne, um, uh, published in The Lancet, and he's really uh, one of my heroes. He's really able to structure and, uh, uh, and uh, dissect, and frame how he sees the world. And uh, we'll, we'll have another slide with, of him. So obesity prevention, our environment matters. So it is not based on uh, scientific research. This is based on philosophy, logic, thinking. In an environment where you cannot eat, where there's no food at all, you will soon starve and die, right? Yeah. Um, and in the past few hundred years, it, almost, it has almost been like that. Um, there was some food available sometimes. Um, and, and, and that's in our evolution made us to, to store that energy, to take up that food, to like fatty foods, to like sweet foods, salt, because it was scarce. Um, so environment matter. Uh, the story about the oyster and the polar bear, do you know that? Probably not, another story. Uh, I thought it may illustrate my point better. Uh, and, and, and it's easy to pick up. Like the oyster lives in the sea. You knew that. Um, and it basically lives in his food. Whenever an, an oyster, he or she, I don't know actually, <laughs> is in need of any nutrients, just sucks up a little bit of water, takes up the nutrient, spits out the rest. Right? There's always been like that. So he does not need to store energy. An oyster is not fatty. Um, whereas on the other end, of the other end of the spectrum, there's the polar bear living in the North Pole. You knew that. Uh, and there's only a few months in the year that there's fish and penguins available to eat. And he needs to take as many penguins and fish up as possible, store the energy for the long, cold month to come, right? So we humans, I think we are more like towards the polar bear. We are more like polar bears than we are oysters. But nowadays, we are the polar bears living in the world of the oyster, <laughs> right? Every time within our reach, you can just do like this, and there's high, high energy, uh, dense uh, food available. And, and also, like, yeah, we are busier than ever, but in a sedentary way. So we do not have to work fiercely enough anymore. Um, and we, we work hard from our chairs. Also here, the picture I uh, took in Amsterdam, polar bears living in the world of the oyster. And this is, of course, a bit exaggeration. We don't live here. In fact, nobody is really living here. But these are the environments that we are sometimes in. And there's also, in our environments that we are always in, there's also opportunities, um, abundance of opportunities to eat unhealthy and a lot and to move less. So at the same time, um, not everybody is overweight or obese. So there's obviously, as Pedro uh, talked about uh, half an hour, there's also individual level factors that matter a lot. And there's 
there's like knowledge, motivation, self-regulation, among others. And there's the social environment, which influence you with norms and values that there are. Hey, come in, have a seat. Here you want a cookie? Here, this is the norm. This is what we do. We eat together, etc. And the physical environment that we live in. Um, and you will see that they interact closely with each other and make, make, making the whole complex system. More about that later. So, which types of environments are there? Again, uh, uh, Boyd Swinburne. Uh, the Angelo framework dissects the environment by type and by size. You have the micro environment, the in-house environment, or the work environment, or, or what's available here. Then you have the, uh, the MISO environment, the neighborhood. Um, what is available in a neighborhood from, from your work or for, from your school. And the macro, more macro level environments. So what's there on the political level or European level or maybe world politics. These are the types of environment, the physical environment. So what is available? What can you really touch? And the social cultural environment, I talked about it a little bit. So what are the norms and the values and the, um, that are there in your network? The economic, so what's the price? What's the price of a broccoli? What's the price of a Mars bar? And political, what are the rules and regulations? So then you have the type and the size together forming a grid. Micro, in-house, physical environment, for instance here. How many screens are there in-house? In, in How many iPads do you have? Or micro, political, what are the rules that there are in-house? How, how, how many hours are the kids able, allowed to, to play on the iPad, for instance? And also on a macro level, for instance, the, the regulations on, uh, or, or the taxes on the sugar, sweet, sugar, sugar and sweetened beverages. Um, then if we talk about environments, and especially the built environment, uh, a thing that is also important to realize is how we can measure them. And there are certain ways we can measure them and also operationalize them in our research. And I thought it would be interesting to tell you a little bit about that because most of you are probably not really familiar on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, this research. So environments you can measure subjectively using questionnaires or using interviews. So that, that would be the perceived environment, so to say. Um, perceptions would be, so um, is your environment safe to walk in? Which does not necessarily mean that it is real safe, but if you perceive it to be safe, then, then it is also a measure of the environment um, uh, in a subject, subjective way. Objective environment um, often goes through databases. So there's a humongous wealth of data collected, not, not with uh, health research in mind, but just for other purposes. For instance, uh, yellow pages, book, if it's still a book, maybe it doesn't exist anymore, but it's a, a book, it was a book, with all kinds of, uh, a list of all kinds of shops and services that are provided and, and places where they are. Or for instance, uh, the network, the, 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 the grid, the, um, the maps that are there, um, where the streets are, it's all, also GIS. Um, audits you can do, field audit and on screen. And I will tell you a little bit more on GIS again. System designed to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage and present all types of spatial, spatial data. And, and we talk about spatial data. Here. That is data related to a location. So geogra geographically reference info with coordinates. And if you have these coordinates and if you have, for instance, a cohort, if you follow participants, then you can link those two with each other and see if there's associations or determinants. Uh, that often uh, happens within uh, statistical programs such as ArcGIS, where you have layers. So you plot your, your respondents on 
a map, another layer, and you have these postcodes, for instance, so you know where they are. And then also you have information about, for instance, fast food outlets here. And then you can, uh, you can say to the program, hey, draw buffers around each and every participant and calculate how many fast food outlets there are in the buffer or in the administrative boundary. Um, calculate the, the shortest distance to the, to the nearest fast food outlet using the street network. So that, that are numbers. So you have for every participant then the a number of fast food outlets within their area, which is a number, and you can work with that in SPSS or whatever program you use. Um, so it's not new, GIS and epidemiology. Everyone knows John Snow and his example was 1815 or what was it, where he plotted cholera cases in Soho in this neighborhood and saw that they were clustered around a water pump. And this was really a nice example of environmental epidemiology. This was with cholera and, and we are doing it with uh, uh, behaviors and obesity, diabetes risk. Yeah. So another way of um, measuring the environment can be done using audits. For instance, an on-site audit. So you, this, these are names of instruments. And you just go to these environments, these neighborhoods, and you, you look around and you tick uh, boxes. Is the pavement walkable? Is there a cycling lane? Are there recreational facilities? What shops are there? What options are there for um, to eat? Um, another way, a more new way, is a virtual audit. So you do exactly the same, but then sedentary, uh, behind the computer, you go through these streets and uh, so you also walk through these streets and, and look, for instance, is there a, a cycling lane here? Uh, are there trees? What, is, what can you buy in the shops? Uh, can you park your bike here? Etc. So this is an example of uh, the Spotlight project. Uh, where we did this in five different countries, in 60 neighborhoods. And we also uh, surveyed the inhabitants of those neighborhoods. And we had like 6,000 um, observations from these in individuals asking about their behaviors, about their health, about their perceived environment. And then we could link it to objective, objectively measured environmental characteristics. Right. So there's advantages, of course, it's free and easy to use, especially in large areas, because GIS information is not always um, measured on the same way for different uh, places in different countries. You save a lot of time and it is safe. But there's also disadvantage, like there's uncovered areas. Not a lot anymore these days, and yet, but you have the temporal variability, is it called, uh, like time of day, season and weather. It's uh, usually sunny in Google Streets. And they also have a filter, like filtering out gravity, graffiti, etc. So it is, can be biased. You need to be careful about it. And the date of data collection is uh, quite important because when you collect data from a survey, for instance, it could be on a totally different moment as when the Google Street View car went through that street. Um, and a views may be obstructed. So uh, our environment matters, and there's all kinds of ways to measure it. But what is the evidence? Um, so most ev evidence comes from cross-sectional research, linking environmental aspect A with uh, weight status B. There's few uh, studies looking up longitudinally and very few experimental studies. And you can imagine maybe why. It's hard to change environments, it costs a lot of money. Um, there are uh, few examples. Um, and what is also often used is natural experiments. So follow people who move to another area or follow people who uh, live to stay in their area 
and, um, and their area is being changed and renovated. So uh, it, it, it is, there's quite something to it. And, and uh, it's not so straightforward, but it is possible. Um, so again, most studies are cross-sectional and they are uh, being reviewed and all the evidence is being scraped together in many reviews that are uh, published in the last few years. Um, I think you get the slides so you, um, you will be able to see them. Um, and uh, so you may expect there's a lot of things in environmental characteristics that, characteristics that really provide consistent relationship with obesity, but there's not really. So one thing that is consistently shown to be associated with obesity is sprawl, urban sprawl, uh, relating to the spread of housing. More sprawl, more obesity. More density, less obesity. Land use mix refers to how the, the houses are, um, houses, uh, leisure, work, shopping uh, are mixed. Uh, more mix, less obesity. But um, this evidence is also a lot coming from the United States of America, where you, you may know that there's usually a CBD, a central business district, where people work. Then there's huge areas where people live. And then there's shopping malls. It's all sep separated and segregated. Uh, nothing like actually Europe or, uh, yeah. So we decided to uh, update the review. Yeah, this is uh, that there's not a lot of other evidence, really. Um, we decided to update uh, the review and also look separ looked separately to uh, outcomes from United States, Australasia, and Europe. Look separately at outcomes from measures that were self-reported, perceived, and objectively measured, and also from studies that used a bit more nuanced approach in their analysis. For instance, taking into account SES of the inhabitants or um, uh, taking into account other individual level factors, mediators, moderators. So many studies came from the USA, 60, some from Canada, 11 from Europe, and five from Australia and New Zealand. Um, and although we looked at all these factors separately, again, there was no, not, no consistent evidence of specific characteristics that were uh, related to obesity. So you can say there's a lack of evidence. Uh, why? Because environments do not matter? Yeah, well, if you, if you look at the literature, it could be. But there's other um, reasons why we think that there is a lack of evidence so, fo so far. So one relates to causation and selection, the definition of exposure and conceptual models. Uh, causation and selection, pretty straightforward. People may, with a certain preference or a certain motivation to, to be physically active, to physically active, may move to neighborhoods where they can be physically active, for instance. Um, definition of exposure, like if you look at neighborhoods environments, it's only one of the neighborhoods that, one of the environments that people are. So if you look at activity space, for instance, here's the home environment where people live and there's friends and grocery. A little bit further away, there's the church, the tennis, the work, where there a lot of time has been uh, is spent and on their way they go to the supermarket. There's a friend here and there's a restaurant there that they usually go, the bakery is there. So it's not so straightforward only about neighborhood environment. This is um, a study that we did um, asking participants, thousands of participants, to draw what they perceive to be their neighborhood. So this is, this is a participant and he or she draw, drew what they perceived to be their neighborhood. Here was, for instance, the church, and then there was the park where they always went. They didn't go to this side because there was uh, nothing really, and this was a busy road, and uh, maybe it was a bit unsafe. And this is only an example, but what we saw is that 
the, the measures that are usually used in this type of research is, for instance, the buffer of the administrative boundary of the, it is, it is not marked here, but it could be like this, an administrative boundary of that neighborhood. And it does not match at all with their activity space. Um, and another thing is the conceptual models that are used. Like for the past 20 years, people are linking straightforward A with B in a linear, they expect a linear relationship. Whereas on the other hand, we know that there's a complex um, system that we live in, right? More like this. This is the foresight, foresight model. I'm sure you're aware of it. And it is, this is a model, right? This is, reality is far more complex than this. Um, uh, there's interaction going on between uh, social environments, um, political environments, economic environments, individual level characteristics. So you're not overweight, but your neighbor is, whereas you live in the same environment. So that's obviously because maybe your neighbor uh, had a traumatic experience in his youth and is uh, going to the fridge every night. Um, so it's more complex than that. Um, but yeah, as a researcher, you need to work with something. And this is a model that is not really workable. <laughs> but you need to take into account mediators, moderators, and interactions. Um, and this is an example of how, uh, uh, in, in one of the studies we did, how individual um, factors such as barriers that one may perceive, and environmental aspects, the, the amount of supermarkets that there are in a neighborhood, interact. So if you have, and, and this is about fish consumption, um, if you have zero barriers toward healthy eating, your fish consumption is high, if there's a lot of supermarkets in your neighborhood. If you have zero barriers towards healthy eating, and there's not a lot of supermarkets in your country, or in your neighborhood, then you are less likely to eat a lot of fish. Almost as much as when you have a lot of barriers and there's a lot of supermarkets. So those things interact and you see the same with the other way around with fast food consumption. So the environmental accessibility matters, the availability matters, but also individual level factors such as, for instance, barriers. Um, I, I was talking about the applicability of the models. This is, another, this is a model based on uh, Steph Kramer's uh, uh, energy model where you have obesity here, influenced by diet, physical activity, sedentary behavior, which is in turn influenced by the different types of environment, micro, macro, the different physical, uh, economic, political, socio, ecologic, um, and moderated by socio-demographics, genetic factors, um, awareness of risk behavior, health, literacy, age, and mediated by mediators such as attitudes, motivation, etc. Uh, quite a useful model, but again, it's a simp simplification. Uh, um, to summarize, our environment matters. It's, yeah, there's limited evidence on the role of specific characteristics, and that's of course, yeah, due to study designs and self-selection procedures, the definition of exposure, the perceived versus the objective measures, and because it's a complex system. It's unlikely that we will find uh, one aspect out of our environment that will solve the problem. It's, ah, it's the light, uh, light bulbs that we have on the streets. If we increase those, then the obesity problem is solved. No, of course not. It's a complex system, and we need to take that into account. But to end with, our environment matters. Um, last slide, I think. So we need to find the, the, the um, water pumps that we have um, uh, for obesity in our traffic lights. A lot of things we already changed in our environment that, that did our health good. If you open the tap, there's free, clean water that you can drink. And, and if you go to the toilet, and you will never see it again because it's in a closed system, it's going away. And it, and it cannot infect you. 
uh, when, when you are going uh, by car, you need to buckle yourself up and you, and you need to stop when somebody's coming from the right or the left. Um, uh, because that's the rules, that's the traffic light that's there. It's put in place that influences our environment to, to, to keep our, ourselves safe. And I think the next step is also be to, in, in these rules and regulation and changes in the environment, we need, we need to take uh, uh, healthy behaviors into account um, and follow that through in our policies. So this is the upstream team. Um, uh, and I would like to ask you to join the upstream community because we need you. Thanks. If you were given free reign of like the first three things that you'd change in the environment, what would they be? So for, uh, for physical activity, I would say um, uh, it's important to, to, to incorporate physical activity in your daily life. That would mean that you, that you would use, for instance, physical activity Active transport, that would be a huge thing to stimul stimulate. And one thing that's really um, helping and not really popular, but is for instance to make it hard to park somewhere, to increase parking uh, funds, to, to discourage parking, that would be something. Uh, and, and, uh, but it, uh, if, if you want people to go on their bikes, it's also different for different countries. For instance, in the UK, most people are used to drive in a car, whereas in, in Amsterdam or in the Netherlands, most people who drive in a car are also cyclists. So they are really aware about the, a cyclist coming from the right or coming to the left. So different aspects is needed for them to enable to encourage uh, an, an environment where, they're, uh, where they're, it's easy to cycle. Um, another thing is indeed to, to have this macro policy level um, uh, interventions, taxation of uh, unhealthy behavior um, uh, is, for instance, one thing that I really believe in. Okay. Yes? Thanks very much. That was really interesting. Um, just picking up on that last point that you just made about taxation, um, in the UK, um, Taxation has been talked about quite a lot in terms of sugar sweetened beverages, especially. Um, there's been quite a lot of people very much being against taxation of, of sugar sweetened beverages or sh sugar containing foods, um, largely because they seem to impact the poorest socioeconomic status families the most. Um, what are your thoughts about SES and yeah. the proposed things that you're suggesting? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. And SES is indeed one of the main determinants of health behavior and unhealthy behavior and also on an environmental level, low SES neighborhoods, that, that is a factor. And it is, I would consider not to be an environmental factor, but it is also um, uh, moderated by factors that are there in the environment. Um, uh, but to answer your point, I think um, whether you really have a small amount uh, adding up to the price of, uh, of a can of fizzy drinks, it doesn't really help, and you're really burdening, I think, also the low SES. It only helps if you increase it a lot. And also, uh, um, uh, um, make sure that it goes together with education, for instance, and, and providing alternatives that are healthy and cheaper. Yeah. Thank you.